Oh, okay. <laughs> you really don't know what you're asking of me. <laughs> right, okay. It's, right, blackmail material is what, yes. is what you're talking about. <laughs> And I guess this is the microphone I'm supposed to use. It seems to work. And we've just got one more minute. Okay, it looks like time to begin. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Um, I work for Agile Bits, the makers of 1Password. Um, I'm going to say I'm um, a lot. And uh, the talk has a title there, Passwords for All Reasons. Authentication passwords are not the same oh, oh, as encryption passwords. And this is something that I actually assume that almost everybody here already knows, but I see so many mistakes made about it that I'm going to just, just assume that every slide in here has a kitten on it. Um, you know, so, so it, it's, uh, I'm hammering home familiar concepts. Okay. So I'm going to actually begin with a story. Um, in, uh, a few years back, Chelsea Manning uh, leaked a huge amount of information to WikiLeaks, um, and then WikiLeaks had it. Um, and here I'm going to talk specifically about the diplomatic cables. Um, uh, WikiLeaks kind of does its own little editorial process, posts a few... Um, on uh, bits and pieces, claiming as insurance they post a huge uh, PGP encrypted file. And um, they're not able to, uh, some, a journalist persuades them that WikiLeaks isn't in a position to do kind of the journalistic editing and revealing of things and uh, 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 gives the encryption password to a journalist at The Guardian. Uh, David Lee, and then The Guardian and some other papers from that start publishing some more of these things, again, all selected um, and redacted. And during this time, copies of that encrypted file are still circulating around. Um, there are torrents of it. And in February uh, 2011, uh, David Lee and a co-author published a book describing his interactions with, uh, with WikiLeaks and uh, says, Assange wrote down on a scrap of paper, 
uh, a collection of history since 1966 to the present day hash. That's the password, he said. But you have to add one extra word when you type it in. You have to put in the word diplomatic before the word history. And it actually took uh, almost half a year for at least people publicly, we don't know what was going on privately, for people connect to connect the password that was revealed in that book with this PGP file that had been kind of circulating around. Um, but at the end of August, uh, this was publicly put together. Um, all of that data which neither the Guardian nor WikiLeaks, and certainly not the U.S. government, uh, wanted made public. Um, and we have this sort of uh, excerpt from uh, exchanges going back and forth. Uh, WikiLeaks posted that it was betrayed by uh, the Guardian. Um, a Guardian journalist has, in a previously undetected act of gross negligence or malice and in violation of a signed security agreement with the Guardian's editor-in-chief, disclosed top secret decryption passwords to the entire unredacted WikiLeaks Cablegate archive. We have already spoken to the State Department and commenced pre-litigation action. We will use the formal statement in due, due course. So we can presume that WikiLeaks was not happy about the full, unredacted, complete uh, decryption and publication of that. Uh, the Guardian, uh, um, in an interview with uh, Kim Zetter at Wired, um, said, um, we note that although the book did reveal the passphrase, it did not reveal the location of the file and that Assange had told the paper that it was a temporary password which would expire and be deleted in a matter of hours. It was a meaningless piece of information except to any, except to the persons who created the database. Now, this, well, let me just say, uh, Matt Blaze wrote a really nice, but really short, uh, post about this whole thing. And in a sense, my talk is just expanding on what Matt Blaze had said those years ago. Everything else aside, the recent WikiLeaks Guardian fiasco nicely demonstrates an important cryptological principle. The security properties of keys used for authentication are not, a, and those used for decryption are quite different. And uh, uh, the emphasis is his. And, um, and then he concludes this with, it might be tempting for us as cryptographers and security engineers to snicker at both WikiLeaks and The Guardian for the sloppy practices that allowed this high-stakes mishap to have happened in the first place. But we should also observe that confusion between the semantics of authentication and confidentiality happens because these are, in fact, subtle concepts that are poorly understood, that are as poorly understood as they are intertwined, even among those who might be laughing the hardest. So, um, uh, the, anyway, so, so the point of this talk is that authentication is not the same as encryption. Passwords used for one have different security properties than passwords used for the other. Different sorts of attacks, different sorts of relevant defenses, uh, different behaviors. Most people, and you can't blame them, do not see the difference at all. And a lot of people, even in this, you know, even in this room, see and know the difference when asked about it, but still when they start thinking about what you what you do with passwords uh, may not always be making the distinctions uh, when it's most useful. 
and confusion leads to exploitable error, as we saw in, in the cable gates case. Um, before I go on, is everybody clear how the cable gate case is an instance of confusion between an authentication and encryption password? Okay. Um, in that case, you're going to get lots of kittens, except kittens is my dog Molly, who's not really very bright. Um, okay, and all, everything I say here is very rough characterization. I'm not attempting to provide definitions of anything. Last year, I was really big on the formal definitions, lots of math, did my slides in LaTeX. Um, uh, this year, I promised no math. Anyway. Um, so, very roughly speaking, authentication is the process in which a prover demonstrates to a verifier that the prover is who or what they claim to be. And so, um, uh, I'm Penelope, let me get my stuff. Uh, Vincent, verifier, what's your password? My password is XYZZY. Is uh, anybody else here old enough to recognize that? Yay. Uh, correct, I'm letting you in. And then there's a room locked away where Vincent controls access to the room and lets Penelope into her precious stuff. And here we go. Encryption uses a key derived from a password in this discussion, um, because we're talking about passwords, and transforms meaningful data plain text uh, into stuff that's indistinguishable from random. And, oh, that was silly. I hate transitions like that. I was playing around with them and didn't eliminate them. Decryption uh, uses the key to transform the data, the ciphertext, back into plain text. And then I've got a picture of this. Um, Molly is more connected to this picture than um, than in the other ones. Uh, in encryption, you've got a password, key derivation function produces a key, um, and the key is used for the decryption or encryption operation, which transforms data from Penelope's precious stuff to a turd. So, um, I figure that I'm going to be remembered for having crappy slides. Okay. And so in each case, there's a password, but it's actually doing very different things. And so an encryption password is a password used for encryption. An authentication password is a password used for authentication. Um, and that should be pretty clear. Now, from a user's point of view, authentication, they enter the correct password, and then they do stuff that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise with some data. Now, let's see what this is like with encryption. See, the user enters the correct password and then does stuff with some data or whatever that they wouldn't otherwise uh, have been able to do. So we can't really blame users for not knowing the difference between an encryption password and an authentication password. David Lee probably had never used an encryption password prior to that PGP file. So how was he to know to treat that password differently than he treated, than he would treat any other password that had, he was told was going to go away? And uh, our metaphors that we talk for encryption of key and unlocking don't actually work really well for encryption. Um, in meat space, a key proves to the lock that it's the right key. Um, and when it unlocks something, it transforms the state of the lock so that access is granted to some resources. Uh, in encryption, the key is used uh, to transform the actual data, and unlocking is the actual transforming. But these are really good metaphors, or decent metaphors, when it comes to authentication. 
uh, the key in meet space proves to, proves to the lock that it's the right key. The key in authentication, it proves to the verifier that it's the right secret. And unlocking is transforming the state of the lock in meet space. And unlocking or logging in um, with an authentication system is transforming the state of the verifier so that access will be granted to some resources. Now, here are some differences in how these things behave. And now, everything I say here is needs to be taken with the knowledge that there are lots of exceptions and fine points on all of this. These are really rough characterizations for typical or possibly exaggerated cases because, in fact, most systems ha involve some hybrid between authentication and encryption, and it can be done in different ways. Um, a password change with an authentication system behaves as you expect. The old password is useless after um, after you change a password. Um, this is not always the case with encryption. Um, likewise, um, you can revoke somebody's access, um, often by changing the password. It's pretty much an instance of the same thing with an authentication system. Uh, with encryption, uh, again, it doesn't work um, that same way. Um, you can have a password reset mechanism with an authentication system. You can tell your Vincent that, okay, we're now going to allow a different password from Penelope. Um, there's no password reset mechanism for encryption. Okay, um, forward secrecy, let me just leave that to later because I actually want to talk a lot about that later if I have, depending on how much time I leave myself. Um, oh, but just going back to this, um, how many people have PGP or SSH key passwords, prior keys? Okay. When is, how many of you have ever, have changed those passwords since you first created them? Okay, for those of you who changed those passwords since you first created them, um, are you aware that they're just encrypting a key? That, that in a sense, the old passwords are still good against the old key files. So if somebody got a key file a long time ago, it's not? No, I'm not talking about revoking a key. I, the, the passphrase for your SSH private key. I did. It regenerates a key? No, I think, I think Jeff, you're saying that if you have the old key file like lying around in backup or something. Yeah, you don't keep the old key. Kind of a, yeah, yeah. That's kind yeah. of a, yeah, the right. premise of why you have your SSH. Right. Exactly for the reason why you bring it up. Okay, I'll have to check up on this today. I'm, a, I'm, I'm confused about that example. Okay, but with PGP, um, when you change your passphrase for your PGP private key, you are not changing that key. That key is the key that was there when it was generated. And so, um, the file. In other words, the way that PGP actually does the standard is that whenever you reset your, uh, your, if it has access to the original file, it, you can actually have it go back and regenerate uh, the file again with the key, make it the old one. So, okay, so so there's a key revocation mechanism in a password change. Okay. Okay, I. Uh, so much for my examples. Um, that's fine. Uh, 
No, no. It's if somebody captures your key file. Suppose you set up a key file with a weak password. Oh, 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 yeah, then the forward secrecy of the SSH protocol is a different question, and I'm not, I, and, and I'm not talking about that. That's probably the simplest way of putting it, and I should have put it that way. Right, right, right. So, so unless you go through a revocation process, but okay. If I if I've actually got let's say Wireshark, something you did a year ago, and I have your public and private key, nothing you're going to do about it. it still right, right. So, 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 so the SSH protocol doesn't ensure forward secrecy. Okay. Um, now, when it comes, to, uh, there are ways of going around passwords, as we all know. Um, you know, and uh, high-powered agencies prefer to go around encryption than through it. Um, and if you're going around passwords, uh, if we go back to that picture of authentication where you've got this room with uh, Penelope's precious stuff in it, uh, you could think about that potentially as, let's say, her bank account. Um, she may very well authorize the bank to do things in that room. So there are other doors into that room other than the one that Vincent guards. Um, this is often one of the reasons why you want to use an authentication system instead of an encryption system, because it does allow um, others to actually manipulate the data. Uh, but again, they're going around the verifier. Um, now, uh, you could do this with encryption by having the key or the passphrase escrowed somehow to, to in a sense, have a way of going around um, going around that process, but that applies as well to authentication. So, so that way of, of a weakness in an encryption system also applies as a potential weakness in an, in an authentication system. Um, you can simply try to break the verifier as opposed to actually, uh, capturing the password. And you can try to break the encryption. Um, typically one is harder than the other. Um, and then both of these systems, when you've got data sitting on the client, you can go around the encryption or around the authentication by all the usual ways of, uh, of simply grabbing the data on the client, memory dumps, whatever. Authentication, you can have your Vincent um, engage in some kind of throttling. You know, say, okay, if, if I get too many requests from Penelope within a few seconds, I'm just going to stop listening to anything she has to say. Um, this is not an option for an encryption system. The best analog in encryption is to use, um, is to use a costly key derivation thing, PBKDF2. Um, Likewise, something like multi-factor authentication is available for authentication systems. It doesn't make any sense at all for an encryption system where there is no authentication. If, if you've got no authentication, you don't even have one factor, but you do have one factor as far as the user is concerned, and the analog for that would be key splitting. Uh, where, um, uh, where the key that's derived from the password might have to be XORed with a key that comes from some other source, maybe a hardware device. Um, things like one-time passwords, 
um, you know, passwords that change with the clock or with counter um, that are often used as second factors in multi-factor authentication. Um, I don't know if there's any analog to that for encryption systems. Okay, you can throttle something if you have tamper-proof hardware. Yeah, sorry, yes, you can you can you can throttle lockout on tamper-proof hardware, but um, but, 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 but but you can't do it if you just have an encrypted file because they don't have to go through your software. Okay, um, now because these behave differently both in terms of attacks and defenses but also because they behave differently in terms of user expectations. Um, you know, there was a talk earlier about frequently changing passwords and, you know, or, or changing passwords once a year. You may not be wanting to do that for encryption passwords unless you're revoking keys in the process. Um, so uh, this I've left completely open, or almost completely open. Um, educate users about the distinction. I don't think that's going to be easy or likely. Um, uh, try to make encryption behave more like authentication. So try to get it to behave in the way that users will expect when they encounter these kinds of passwords or systems. Um, and that's kind of part of designing tools that discourage mistakes, like we saw with the, uh, with Cablegate. And one of the things, um, uh, in this, in this second point about making encryption behave more like authentication, is exactly like what you described, where when you change a password or your passphrase for your PGP key, it starts to automate or semi-automate a key revocation um, process, and uh, that uh, that then gets some of the kinds of semantics that people expect um, from uh, from authentication and. Uh, but mostly I've posed these. Um, another thing is in one password, we're looking at a way to apply forward secrecy um, with a master password change, but we don't have that at the moment. And that does not fit with uh, user expectations, so we consider this a problem. The fundamental problem, uh, the fundamental problem comes down to you, uh, you can are allowed to have active uh, safeguards whenever you're dealing with authentication because with authentication, I don't have the data. Whereas with encryption, I've actually got all the data. So you can put every kind of safeguard you can ever think about it, short of what I'm talking about with the other. But you're, you're not wrong, but there's, there's a subtlety here. With the iron key, I actually physically have it, but I don't have the data itself. So that's why you're right, it is more like authentication. But it actually is it's encrypted because it's its own thing, right? So the difference is, is that with whenever I've got, I, I don't have the actual data authentication mechanisms like what you're talking about work, whereas they don't work with with, uh, with whenever I've already got it because all I've got to do is keep replicating the base data. In other words, the file. Yeah, right. I can just keep rec recreating it and then running you know, brute force, whatever right. other attack on it. And right. that's why these fail otherwise. Right, right. So that's why things like throttling lockout aren't normally relevant. That's why things like throttling lockout aren't normally re relevant for uh, encryption data. I'd like to know if there are questions or comments from anyone else. It seems kind of like the sense you present as far as education and how to teach people distinctions is that once you publish an encrypted file, you can never take it back. And that there are two pieces that you need. There's the contents of the file, there's the key. And that you can never ever remove information, remove knowledge from people. 
can't erase the print. And so once you reveal it there, you need to remember there's this precious thing now. This key is even more precious because it's the only thing that stands between the knowledge that I can't take away from the rest of the world and the knowledge that I can't take away from the rest of the world. Well, 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 yes, that's what we need to communicate to people. But how are we going to communicate that to to people? I mean, it. You know, I don't know what the actual conversation between Lee and Assange was, but it sounded to me like neither was particularly clear on the concept. This statement that would only last for an hour or two is more towards authentication. Right. He but, what he was thinking. Like, how did he believe this? Right, right. So he, I, I, uh, in later statements, he said that, that they thought he was going to take the file down, but that's still not. Really, it. Um, sorry. Mm, there is a, I think, a good way to educate people about the distinction is to talk about what happens when they forget their password. If it's an authentication password, they just have to see the sysadmin and it, it reset it. If it's a non encryption password, the data is lost forever. And uh, that, that doesn't invoke um, an attack. It's uh, rather something that. Uh, People believe they are forgetting their password, they know that. And it's not magical. And it really raises the issue. So I think it's a good way to introduce. So okay, yeah, that. yeah. So that's a distinction that people have some experience with. So, so, so the suggestion was base your education off of the fact that one kind of password can be reset and the other is if you lose it, it's gone forever. And and that's a distinction that more people are familiar with, so you can use that to help to to, to help guide um, that. Um, you had a question. Oh, sorry. Okay, go on. You sure? Um, was that a can for a question or not? No, wasn't. Okay. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yes, right. And that correlates with this distinction that I'm trying to make. But again, there could have been a key escrow kind of system which would have allowed some kind of recovery. So it's, none of the distinctions that I made or, or differences are really hard and fast. You can always design systems that are kind of exceptions to every point that I said, but still there is this essential distinction. And well, I, I mean, I, I wasn't recommending escrow services. I was just uh, key escrow systems. I was just pointing out, you know, you know, I was just pointing out that it's not always the case that uh, that the distinction between encryption passwords and authentication passwords matches up with what happens if you forget your password. Typically it does, but I was just saying there are going to be cases where that isn't going to be um, fully diagnostic. Um, Is the second bullet DRF model? You know, you're trying to give someone data and then you know, an Um, you know, it could be solved that way, in which case it gets more like, like that authentication of a physical, yeah, of the iron key. Um, but in one respect, uh, you know, as we saw, if, um, if changing your passwords for your SSH keys or PGP keys actually leads to key revocation, then that gets you some of the way there. That is one way to get encryption passwords to begin to behave a little bit like authentication passwords. Yeah, kind of tied into that, one of the hybrid approaches you can go with is where there is some party that holds your ciphertext, and they don't know your key, so they can't get to it. But they have a way of knowing um, whether you know your key or not. And they're the authenticator, they're the verifier that decides to grant access to something. And so that's a single point where um, if you change your password and they honor their promise and they stop revealing the old cyber tech to anybody else, then you get the, the 
behavior match. If you get something with chain attack, you're actually going to have immunity. But you have to trust that one party is, is not going to go and try and kill it. That's what you're going to do. Right. The hardware devices. Oh, the hardware devices encapsulating that behavior into a different Okay, but. Uh, yeah, it it can be done in such a way where you don't have to, you know, that is, um, if you're using the right kind of protocols to that authenticator where they never have the option to, 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 to see your plain text password, then you can use the same password for authentication and encryption. So, so yeah, I mean, I assume, um, you know, and, and we know that there are actually plenty of systems that do behave this way. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much.